Well, here we are, back at the war table again, and it's time to talk strategy. In this video, I'll be discussing the events that transpired on the road to King's Landing. Again, a spoiler warning is in place. The video will critique the campaign to defeat Cersei, offer an alternate plan of action, and discuss the merits of the naval ambush at the end of the episode. Let's begin where the show does, with the northern commanders rallied once more around a map of the realm. They start sensibly, by assessing their losses and comparing their remaining forces to those of their opponent. They show a clear understanding that the balance of power is dangerously even, and that a major element of their opponent's force is a naval one. This last point will be an important factor in my critique. From here, strategies are proposed for the campaign to defeat Cersei. Missandei speaks first by suggesting a victory gained from winning the hearts and minds of the people. She believes that when the inhabitants of the realm find out what has been done for them by defeating the dead, they will take Daenerys' side. A logical assumption. Daenerys counters by stating that Cersei will make sure that they don't believe it. This is also a valid rebuttal that holds some weight given Cersei's demonstrated capabilities when it comes to propaganda and deception. We're off to a good start. Characters are behaving rationally and we can see the merits of both sides. I'll have to admit though, I'm on Team Asande here, and the propaganda war will be the crux of my alternate plan. As the conversation proceeds, I continue to be impressed. Varys reports that the Iron Islands have been reclaimed in the name of the Queen, and the new Prince of Dorne has pledged his support. The implication being that regardless of whether or not people will believe the story of the battle against the Night King and the undead, the important kingdoms of the realm are already taking Daenerys aside. Even if the balance of power at the moment is even, as was stated, things are trending in favor of the Northern Coalition. This means that time is on their side, a fact that should be wielded as a weapon. While this was all swirling in my mind, I was already bracing myself to be disappointed. However, to my great surprise and joy, the show actually blew me away with the direction of the conversation. Jon and Tyrion now propose starving out their opponents in a bloodless and efficient move. To the credit of the writers, they even go so far as to talk about choking off naval supplies using dragons. This is brilliant. However, I was once again filled with dread as the camera panned to Daenerys, whom I expected to throw a petulant tantrum. When she replied simply with a cool, calm, all right, I audibly whooped. This is the caliber of conversation I was expecting from the series. However, a complication is introduced by Sansa, who wants to further delay the campaign in order to rest her troops. This is a very reasonable request. However, Daenerys shoots back an icy stare and questions her loyalty, arguing for immediate action. We now have a great, dramatic confrontation that I was impressed by. Some might think that this is a one-sided argument and that Sansa was totally correct, but I'd like to argue briefly on behalf of Daenerys. The Targaryen Queen has clearly realized that while time may favor the North, it does not necessarily favor her personally. This is made evident by the line, the longer I leave my enemies alone, the stronger they become, which is a thinly veiled reference not to Cersei, but to the very people at the table and the growing concern Daenerys has that her allies will turn on her. So for her, it makes sense not to delay. Such urgency may seem rash, but there is historical precedent. I'm reminded of the dual invasions of medieval England in the 11th century. At this time, the defending Anglo-Saxon king, Harold Godwinson, faced a northern invasion from the Kingdom of Norway and a southern invasion by the Normans within the same year. The Anglo-Saxon force defeated the Scandinavians at the Battle of Stamford Bridge before executing a rapid march of over 200 miles in just a few weeks to face the Normans. While the Anglo-Saxons were ultimately defeated at the Battle of Hastings, the event does show the feasibility of such a rapid campaign maneuver. Ultimately, the question over timing gets decided when Jon breaks the stalemate by siding with Daenerys. If I were there, I'd be a bit hesitant with the strategy, but would give it my seal of approval. However, things quickly start to fly off the rails when Tyrion attempts to recap the strategy. He states, So if all are in agreement, Jon and Ser Davos ride down the King's Road with the northern troops and the bulk of the remaining Dothraki and Unsullied. A smaller group of us will ride to White Harbor and sail from here to Dragonstone with our queen and her dragons accompanying us from above. Whoa, 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 whoa. That is not what was discussed. There seems to have been a leap here. We agreed on urgency, but not this. Okay, so for starters, we should not split up our already depleted forces. Second, we should not gamble on anything at sea. Dragons are certainly powerful, but the Iron Fleet has routinely proved itself to be a force to be reckoned with. You've all spoken at numerous times of its elusiveness, so we should be sure it is properly scouted and tracked before engaging. In fact, does it even make sense to be engaging this fleet at all? 
Historically, fleets at sea could be defeated safely from land. After all, the sailors needed to be resupplied from somewhere, and denying them a safe port meant they would actually begin to suffer attrition within short order and be forced to retreat or surrender. This was how Alexander the Great's largely land-based force defeated the superior Persian navy during the campaigns into Anatolia. In the case of Game of Thrones, it has already been mentioned that many houses are turning on Cersei, and that the Iron Islands have been recaptured. This greatly limits the Iron Fleet's options and should keep it on a very short leash around King's Landing. No need to fight it for now, let it lay impotently at sea and wither away. So Tyrion, we shall all travel by road to King's Landing. As to the Queen's concerns about the security of her claim to the throne, the march down the King's Road shall be a political statement to the Seven Kingdoms. For inspiration, I draw on the rulers throughout history who have marched their armies through the lands to overawe the people. I draw particular inspiration from the Roman triumphs where leaders and their conquering armies were paraded before massive crowds. With regards to the message being sent, we want to show that Daenerys is THE rightful ruler of the realm and that she is powerful yet benevolent. This can be achieved through carefully planned propaganda, as Masande had originally proposed. First of all, determining the order of march will be important. At the head of the column must be Daenerys and her dragons. Behind them will be the leaders of her various supporters, in order of importance. This will be a key moment to establish the relationship between Daenerys and Jon before the people. Jon should be riding behind Daenerys to show his deference to her rule, or better yet, should be walking alongside her, holding the reins of her horse. This will show all onlookers that he is a trusted, honored subject of the queen treated with dignity, but that ultimately he is subservient to the crown. To drive this message home, I'd have some banners set up behind them. The largest flag should show House Targaryen, while all other banners should show the loyal houses of the coalition, but with smaller banners. Visually, this will once again re-emphasize the new order of things and make clear everyone's place, with Daenerys in the front. Perhaps now would even be a time to whip out a brand new family crest to show the joining of House Stark and Targaryen. To show the traits of power and benevolence, I would propose the following. Power will be shown by having the dragons circle overhead. At key intervals along the road, they should find safe means to demonstrate their power, such as fire breathing on stone cliff faces. Really, anything to leave a visual, permanent message for centuries to come. Perhaps masons can even be employed to carve reliefs of Daenerys in these cliffs and her great deeds, as was done by the kings of Persia to commemorate their achievements. Benevolence will be shown by having the onlooking crowd plied with food and gold paid for by the army. This has worked wonders historically. Additionally, I'd have Daenerys seek opportunities to engage with the people under the watchful eye of bodyguards. She might forgive debts, free prisoners, console war widows, confer blessings, and of course kiss babies. Basically, roll out every trick in the book to win Daenerys the affection of the people, as she had already done back in Essos. If you're worried about assassins, then fake the whole thing. Plant some trusted actors in the crowd for you to engage with. This propaganda move would overcome anything Cersei could muster. Seven hells, this should be easy. There are already rumors swirling in King's Landing that Cersei was the one responsible for setting off a bomb in the city that killed hundreds. How can this terrorist compete with Daenerys? the mother of dragons, the breaker of chains, the guardian of the realm. Not only will my proposed propaganda move gain the advantage in the short term, but it would also lay a solid foundation for the queen's eventual rule. Unfortunately, however, folly prevailed and the army of the north split up. It's now time to talk about the inevitable disaster that followed. To briefly summarize things, Daenerys, her dragons, and a small fleet set sail down to Dragonstone. Thanks to virtually no scouting, they are ambushed by the Iron Fleet basically around the location where they expected it to be. A dragon gets shot down by long range, super precise artillery fire, and the northern fleet is literally blown up. It's at this point that I'm pulling out my hair. The show has completely squandered my initial optimism, and we're back to square one here. Okay, so let's talk about this. We can start with the context for the naval ambush. Surprise battles at sea were historical realities. In fact, it was often very difficult for ancient navies to find each other. Scouting might be carried out by riders and watchtowers on the coast, while small fastboats could act as a screen before the main fleet. Despite such precautions, it was still fairly common for fleets to just bump into one another. This was especially true during the First Punic War, when Roman and Carthaginian ships navigated the winding shores of Sicily. At the time, Carthage was by far the dominant naval power of the Mediterranean. 
Recognizing this, Rome took the appropriate action of investing in its own fleet before ever attempting a major naval engagement. They took many steps to gain tactical parity, such as building an entire navy numbering in the hundreds of ships from scratch and inventing a new type of boarding bridge to transform the nature of sea battles. The same level of strategic preparation is not demonstrated by the forces of Daenerys, sailing obviously to their doom. You could argue that they did not have time, in which case you'd actually be arguing against the entire naval operation to begin with. If however you argue that the entire well-being of the fleet rests in the hands of the dragons, then you better plan on being disappointed when these aren't used masterfully. Unfortunately, this was not the case in the show, when they failed to conduct proper scouting and somehow missed the entire Iron Fleet. But let's assume that the ambush has been sprung. Now onto the weapons used by the Iron Fleet. These giant ship-mounted ballistas may seem far-fetched, but there is some historical precedent. Ancient warfare at sea was fought in a variety of ways, including boarding, ramming, and ranged combat. The first two were generally the most common, but when ships got large enough, they grew fairly resistant to these sorts of attacks. The additional deck space on these bigger vessels also allowed them to mount artillery pieces. These might be anti-personnel variants to sweep enemy decks and soften them up before an assault, or could be larger catapults meant to take out large land-based fortifications. We have evidence of truly monstrous ships built by the Ptolemies of Egypt, which carried a complement of 7,000 crew members and could fit huge pieces of artillery on their back. However, such large vessels were hardly seaworthy. Even if they were, their artillery was never meant to blow up entire fleets at range. Accuracy was just not possible given the technology and the rocking seas. Rather, sea-based artillery of this caliber would be used to knock out the static defenses of fortified ports. To see them used in the show to shoot dragons out of the sky was highly unrealistic. So when you combine the lack of preparation, the failure to scout, the overpowered nature of the artillery, you get a really facepalm inducing scene. I get the story beats that the show is trying to hit, but man is this writing sloppy. My main issue is that what we got was a plot development resulting from pure incompetence rather than superior planning, something I would think would be unacceptable for a Game of Thrones adaptation. Frankly, there are tons of ways to write a scene that gets you the same outcome, but with a more satisfying chain of events leading to it. Here's what I would propose. Start with a shot of Daenerys' fleet advancing along the coast. Make a point to show they are advancing with caution. Cut between shots of some smaller scout ships out front and the dragons cruising overhead. Have Varys tell Tyrion that his little birds report the Iron Fleet is on the verge of collapse thanks to their lack of supplies. Tyrion can then reply with something to the effect of, Yes, our queen has made sure of that. Cut to Daenerys torching a single ironborn ship at sea, transporting grain. This will all show that the naval strategy is actually working. As the northern fleet approaches Dragonstone, show a shot of the dragons circling the island from a safe distance above. Have them see no fleet in the immediate vicinity. However, what they should see are a bunch of unarmed supply ships at anchor and men unloading them. As the dragons circle, bells start to sound and the men below run away shouting. Daenerys appears to hold the element of surprise. However, as she swoops down to score some easy kills, men uncover an entire battery of prepared artillery. At close range, these now start to unload on the queen and have much better chances of hitting her. She realizes the danger and executes a quick turn to get out of the line of fire. Rhaegal attempts to do the same, but is slowed due to his previous injuries. A couple projectiles tear up his wings and he crashes to the ground, immobilized, but alive. Daenerys wheels about, taking advantage of the time between volleys and lays waste to the ambush teams. Now on the horizon the Iron Fleet appears, this was all a clever trap. Daenerys is now in the terrible position of choosing to defend her downed dragon or her fleet. With horror, she watches as the Iron Fleet splits in two. One force catches a favorable wind and quickly descends on her unprepared northern fleet. The other half heads for her. This squadron is filled with archers and artillery. You get a dramatic shot on the beach as Daenerys and Drogon stand bravely by Rhaegal as the shots start to rain down on them. They are easy targets. Have some epic moments like Drogon torching a volley of arrows in defense and deflecting shots with his tail. However, as the Ironborn draw closer, Rhaegal's fate is inevitable and Daenerys is forced to fly off for her own safety and to save her remaining friends. As she looks back, she sees Euron jump off his ship and plunge a spear through Rhaegal's head. Bam! Cut to credits. 
I hope you appreciated my historical commentary on the episode and enjoyed the bit of fan fiction I allowed myself at the end there. If you enjoyed, definitely check out my other series on historical topics and consider contributing to my channel on Patreon. Thanks for watching.